My entire life, I've had a purpose. Working really hard, training hard, waking up early, getting to the beach before everybody else. When you're competing, that's what you do. That's what you're all about. Your whole life is targeting that objective, where I am going to absolutely attack that. I'm not ready to hang my hat up. I want to keep really pushing myself. Growing up, Robbie Nash was a superhero. He was the equivalent to like Superman in water sports to me. Robbie's one of the best multi-sport watermen in the world. He's a windsurfer, kiter, and a great stand-up paddler. An insane competitor. For the longevity that he's had in his career and the level that he's still at now at his age, and to be at the top of three great water sports, he's definitely a freak of nature, I think. There's always been great athletes, whatever their sport, but the champions are just another level. Robbie is a champion. He's a cut above the best. Robbie has a 24 world championships. No other pro athlete has had a career like his. Robbie's one of the greats. He's one of the Jordans. He's one of the Woods. He's one of the Carmichaels. He's one of the all-time greatest athletes you need to know. Paradise. You can run around naked. I can shoot my guns. Nobody to bother you. My wife pretty much designed the whole place, and it took us about two years to build it. Midsummer, you get the sunrise and the sunset over the ocean because of the way the property sticks out. It's like a peninsula that goes out into the ocean. And it's really quiet and quite sort of peaceful. Hey, it's not a bad life that surfing has provided you. Yes. You're doing what you love. I've been really lucky forever. I mean, I, I was in a sport that had no, no, uh, no path to follow. You know, now if you're a basketball player, a football player, or even a skateboarder or a snowboarder, you can look forward and say, well, that, I mean, unless something major changes it, there's a path. You can see how that guy went and how you can go and potentially make a career out of something. But um, the sports that I've involved, been involved with didn't exist until I was doing them. But there's definitely no plan. summer sport, the new wave in Hawaii. This is the world's newest, most exciting response to the universal challenge of wind and water. Anyone can do it, no matter where he lives and no matter his age. This is the ultimate free ride. My dad invented windsurfing in 1967. He was friends with Hobie Alter, who did the Hobie Cat, and Tom Morey, who did the boogie board. And they all would hang out on the beach, and the wind would always come up and blow out the waves. And my dad was just thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have a sail on a surfboard? And kind of snowballed from there. When I was real young, there was, there was no such thing as windsurfing. And then Hoyle Schweitzer put a sail on a surfboard. That got my attention. It's kind of a combination of board riding and flying. Along comes this sport that has a 12-foot board, this bagged out sail. The booms back then that you hang on to were made out of teak wood, and they were eight and a half feet long. Everything was just super low performance, but it was right on the cusp of evolving. 
There were half a dozen or so windsurfers in Hawaii at the time. Ken Clyde, Mike Horgan, Larry Stanley, Dennis Davidson, you know, just a, a small group of kind of hippie Kailua guys that discovered the sport. You know, just luckily met them one day at the beach. It was really intriguing because I was a sailor and a surfer, and I'm like, wow, this is kind of cool. But I couldn't even get the sail out of the water. I wasn't tall enough or strong enough. And so Mike Horgan took me tandem. So I, I held onto the boom inside of him, got going, and then he'd let go. And I'd sail along until I'd crash, and then he'd go and get me started again. And I was just blown away on the sensation of it, the whole feeling. Harnessing the wind, and you're making it all happen. You gotta pull the sail out of the water and grab that boom and lean back, and there's really a complexity of things going on there. That sensation was just unreal. It was like surfing with the wind, and it just, grab me, that was what I wanted to do. My family heard about Robbie Nash, a little kid that's really good once he gets a sail up. He was so small for so long. We never thought he would be taller than five foot 10. <laughs> but when he grew up, it was all over with. The legend of Robbie started when he was, you know, like 13 years old. First time he ever beat all the men at a championship. In 1976, I went off to Nassau, Bahamas, to the World Championships by myself. How old were you? 13. I'm surprised your parents let you go. In hindsight, I can't believe my parents let me go. A free trip to the Bahamas, we were certainly not going to say no, but we couldn't afford to go with him. I sent him with his vitamins and his peanut butter and the staple things that I figured he'd need. It was cool, 13-year-old kid running around the Bahamas by himself. There were over 400 competitors in the event, huge European contingent. Robin Nash was a phenomenon, and this uh, kid, 13 years old, competing with grown men. And at the start, was already 30 yards in front of everybody. I think at the time, he didn't even weigh 60 pounds, so he just flew past people. Sail going, we kick ass to everybody. He just slaughtered everybody. Robbie called, and it was Randy that answered the phone. Sorry. <laughs> and he ran out the front door screaming, he won, he won, he won. They were all surprised. I came home with all these massive trophies. It was awesome. You get to that point, if you get that good, where do you go? I mean, you're 13 years old and you're the world champion. What do you do? Go downhill or stay there? And he won a whole lot more after that. He won racing. He won slalom. He won wave. And he won overall. Number one, number one, number one, number one. US won one, one, one. I'd go to these contests and I'd hear, like, yeah, well, we're gonna get Robbie this time. And I'd look at the guys and think, it's great that you guys have this positive attitude, but it's not gonna happen. Unless Robbie breaks his mast and swims the entire heat, he's going to beat you. Rob was just a machine and everybody feared him. He was focused, intense, aggressive, and more powerful all the things that world champs need to be to get the job done. Robbie takes some credit for the explosion of windsurfing around the world, because he always won. Nash pumping for air. Yes! Robbie Nash was an incredible 360. Oh, goodness. What happened is the discipline started getting separated. Wave sailing became more specialized, racing became more specialized, and Robbie eventually left the racing and went straight into the wave sailing and changed the paradigm and made everyone look up and say, okay, well, that's what we're gonna do. And Robbie Nash, of he now good or minder good surfed, he blijft the absolute middle point of his fans. In the 80s, when it really started to take off, windsurfing became this craze, especially in Europe. It was like a really weird, crazy scene and it had the backing of all the advertisers and it really made its way into the mainstream. And that was super exciting. 
we'd have events and you'd have 100,000 people come, just massive events. We had indoor events in Paris that would sell out the Paris Bercy Stadium with a line of fans in a little swimming pool with metal ramps to jump off of. 12,000 screaming fans with painted faces and holding up signs. It was an incredible time. I've spent probably six months of my life on a little tiny island in the North Sea off Germany called Silt, you know, right at the Germany-Denmark border. It's been the longest running World Cup on the Pro Tour, and it's a pretty special place. I mean, not just for me, but for windsurfing in general and, and the history of windsurfing. This is the last remaining big event on the tour. We used to have a lot of them. Japan was huge, France was huge, Holland was huge. There were a lot of big events, and this is the last one. I'm not competing anymore, but I still go to that event promotionally every year. Herzlich willkommen, der Winterfrigende Morgen Nash. Und jetzt seid ihr gefragt. Das Niveau von die Jungs und die Mädchen auch. Und es ist wichtig dass es immer noch am selben Niveau ist, mit selben alten Gesichtern wie Robbie Nash. Es ist gut, dass ich noch dabei bin. Aber ja, es ist noch frisch gehalten, oder? Es ist noch frisch aus. Also. Danke. Ja, sure. Windsurfing at one point was the fastest growing sport in the world, but not nowadays. Just like any sport, it goes up and down and it tapers off. Windsurfing is a pretty niche sport. You know, for example, every year we get this report that ranks the size of all these different sports. And windsurfing, in terms of participation, ranks below snowshoeing as a sport. Not an art, snowshoeing, I'm just saying. It's just, that gives you some idea about scale. I think for windsurfing, we kind of developed the sport out of the realm of accessibility for a lot of people. The equipment got too extreme. The conditions required to ride at that high level are too hard to find. Windsurfing is tough. It's not the easiest thing in the world to learn. You are going to get wet. You are going to fall down. You are going to get discouraged. And a lot of people just can't get over that hurdle. They're like, forget this. I'm going to do something easier. And then what eventually happened as well is other sports came along that were more accessible, like kite surfing. Something like kite surfing is a lot easier. Everybody gets good. Or stand up paddling now. You know, anybody can do that. This is our range of paddles for 2016, which includes everything for the sport of stand up paddling, from our cakey kids paddle. Robbie was one of the first big companies that really started doing a lot of great R&D and started to come out with some really high tech stuff and his company ended up being one of the bigger brands in the boarding industry. You know, I love these sports and the lifestyle that they represent, but I wouldn't do it if it was just about making money. To just make money, there's better ways. I'd probably do way better if I just sat behind my computer all day for a few years and really just did that, but that's not, to me, what life is about. breakfast. For me, the most difficult part of my career, life, whatever it is right now, is not having that thing that I'm targeted. Because now I do all these things. I ride, I'm still good, I'm not out of shape. But without competition, it's like, what are you, what are you doing? And it's not the pressure from other people, it's from inside, just needing that bullseye that you're trying to throw the dart at the center of. And I was freaking hitting the center of that thing all the time, and now it's like I'm not even throwing a dart anywhere. In my head, I'm a professional board rider. This is what I do. And if I'm not there doing that, who the fuck am I? I need something that I'm consciously and subconsciously driven by. And for me, I was always into big waves. 
know, windsurfing opened up massive outer reef breaks that were not rideable or accessible on anything else. And I loved that aspect of it. And Road Jaws windsurfing for the first time, the winter of 95. Jaws is probably hands down one of the biggest, famous big waves that we have here in Maui. Robbie and I were both surfing in giant surf years before everybody else. I can go back and bust the video out if you want, but. <laughs> Robbie is known as this champion windsurfer. People don't realize what a great surfer he is. I think he's a better surfer than I am. And I'll tell you a good story about Robbie that probably nobody knows. Robbie Nash came out with us on one of the early Jaws ventures. So I'm sitting on the boat, and he starts looking at my board. I go, well, give it a try. And this was one of those special ways that just blew up and started forming this cavern that was just enormous. He made the turn, and he was the first guy to get in the tube at Jaws like that. Before that, all we were doing was trying to survive. And now suddenly, wait a minute, we can get in the tube. <laughs> you know, the rest is history. There's kind of a scene in big wave surfing right now. Like when Jaws is breaking, there's 50 guys in the water. And they're young and hungry, and they want to get their picture taken. And that's awesome. I don't want to take anything away from it. They're taking these sports to new levels. These days, the expected thing is to go do a movie about big wave riding. But I just want to expand into other things and finding waves that I've never ridden before. Instead of riding the biggest wave at Jaws and you know, getting a 50-yard ride and kicking out, I want to ride the wave from beginning to end and connect turns. And it's not like I want to stop riding Jaws, but I need more than that. If you're someone who's spent your life competing and then you stop, then there's a void. And we have to fill the void. And so how do we fill the void? I think it's good for everybody to put a carrot in front of them and go after it. You always need that. I think for Rob, he's done a lot of extremely big things in his life. That carrot needs to be something big. Riding one single wave as long as it goes, from beginning to wherever it ends. With stand-up paddling, you can really have fun on waves that aren't that great for anything else. And some of those long waves are like that. They're flat spots in the middle or sections that are hard to get across. Like if you were shortboarding, you'd get shut down. You know, you have to stay too much in the peak, and then a flat section comes, and you just can't get through it, and then the wave runs away again. And on a stand-up, you can connect all those sections. And that's challenging. There's a lot of skill involved in riding a wave as long as you can to actually find where the power points are and, and stay with that power for all that time. If you're comparing it to riding the biggest wave, riding a long wave is a little bit more personal. Trying to quantify the longest waves around the world is something that I can kind of grab a hold of and sink my teeth into and know that I, I have an objective. The Skeleton Coast, Skeleton Bay in Namibia right now has one of the longest waves around. And it's a barreling, zipper, full-on performance wave. Surfer Magazine had a competition to find the most perfect wave, and uh, guys were just searching on Google Earth and found it. There's no place in the world where you can get a two-mile-long sand barrel. I think the first time I saw footage of it, I was convinced it was faked and that they had looped a section of a wave over and over and over again. It really looks borderline unnatural. There's one in Peru called Chicama that with the right conditions could be the world's longest rideable wave. It is a tip of land that goes into the ocean and with all the southwest swells, 
they would just wrap and go all along the coast, peeling and peeling, peeling perfectly. And it is just a huge ruler. It just sets a giant line, a wall, and then it just goes for something like two and a half miles. I think it's incredible that Robbie wants to ride the longest wave in the world. Who wouldn't want to do that? You know, he's choosing a perfect craft to do that, which is stand up paddling, because when you can catch one, why wouldn't you want to catch two or three or four or five of the longest waves ever? I'd like to see that, or maybe I'd like to, you know, give him a run for his money for that one. <laughs> Hi, Lenny is a prodigy like Rob. He can do everything. He can do stand-up, he can do prone, he can do foil, he can do kite. I mean, three quarters of the things that he can do, 90% of the people don't even know how to do. Kai, been riding with him since he was eight years old. He's like six-time SUP world champion. Super competitive windsurfer, would be a competitive kiter if he wanted to be. Motivating to be around because he's like Energizer Bunny, just wants to go all the time. Robbie and Kai are so similar in that they both started pretty young, and and I would say that Kai's yearning to want to be a big athlete was because he saw that the path was laid out by Robbie. He had the best example from Robbie, and knowing that the big guru is behind you gave him the confidence that not even the father could give. You know, over the years, the relationship has definitely changed. It went from being, here's my idol, to being a fellow competitor, to the point where both of them are looking at each other with mutual respect. Robbie is somebody that I've always looked up to. He's a mentor, he's a sponsor. So I feel like I have to be the best, you know, to prove my worth to his brand. But at the same time, I know Robbie's so competitive that he wants to kick my butt and prove that he's still the man. I love getting on the water and pushing it with him. If I can go a little deeper and jump a little higher, then by all means, I'll rub it in his face. <laughs> in surfing, there's a kind of friendly competitive drive that people have. You want to one-up the next guy. You know, you want this guy to do something that's gonna, like, get you fired up. I wanted Chuck to come along, because Chuck's like Captain America. Blonde hair and big, puffed up, tan, muscly guy. But he's a charger. He rides 100 miles an hour, day and night. Chuck Patterson is always doing something innovative. He's one of the first guys to surf giant waves on skis being a guy known in the ski world for jumping off 200-foot cliffs. It's pretty insane. Being 48 years old, he's still charging without any phase of the consequences. I think he's like an illustration that came to life. When you see that huge grin and that giant smile. It is a good mix. I mean, you have Kai being kind of the young gun, and then myself. I'm closer in age to Robbie than I am with Kai, but I'm still a kid at heart. <laughs>
I'm feeling kind of lucky. I got my cold this week instead of next week, at least. All right. So we're going to regroup in a couple of days? Sounds like it. Sounds good. All right, thanks, guys. See ya. Thank you. Oh, man, what happened? Oh, uh, I was kind of fucked up. Just crashed the landing, kiting. Just came down from a jump. Didn't even, you know, it wasn't a crash or anything. Nothing spectacular. Nothing I haven't done a million times. You know, I landed fine, and then as I, I loaded up, my back foot came out of the strap. Front foot stayed on the board. Just kind of tried to split me in half. I felt something pop, and I thought it was my back. But sitting there on the beach, I sat there for maybe a half an hour, and I was like, Started getting lightheaded, and all of a sudden just went flush, started feeling queasy, and I guess I just fell over backwards and passed out. And I guess the reason I passed out is I had all this internal bleeding. So when I popped my pelvis, I broke my pelvis. He just isn't supposed to put the left foot down. So they taught him to get into cars backwards, but they didn't know that he's got cars this big. You have quite a commanding position on the road. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs> Ooh. Sorry. They air vacked me to Honolulu, to Queens Medical Center over there. Had surgery, had a really good guy. Put it back together. If you can see the mouse, this is where he splayed the pelvis here. So that opening is the break? Yeah, it's it's the he actually didn't break a bone. He tore the ligaments between the bones here. Yeah. So that opening shouldn't be it should look like should look like that. So that's the space between it should look like. There is a normal space there. Go back to the first one, please. You just want to look at my junk again. That's <laughs> it. Yeah, you, if you really want to know, we can use our imagination here. <laughs> so when you saw that, were you concerned for him given what he does, you know? Oh, yeah, I mean, of course. It's not a typical athlete's injury you know I mean I, I trained in trauma and so trauma is I mean I went to Afghanistan to take care of guys getting blown up and uh, in our wars and, and and guys getting big car accidents so this is kind of a 60 mile an hour accident blown up from an IOD type of thing not so much of a, a sports injury you don't see this in sports too often you know so it's kind of a more on the extreme side how fast were you going when you hit that wasn't not that fast but water's pretty hard yeah. You know, it's... And that yeah. kite carries power, too. Yeah, that's the thing. You that know, kite carries big-time power. The kite doesn't slow down. This thing's going to hold it. Until it's not unusual for people with that kind of an injury to die in the first five minutes. This is kind of looking yeah. bottom up. To rupture a femoral artery, and then you're, you're toast. You know, I think we're, we're lucky to have him still with us. Is it kind of right in the back? Right yeah, there? Like... At the same time, with Robbie doing the things he's been doing for as long as he's been doing it, it wasn't like a surprise. Like, oh my God, he hurt himself. It's like, wow, he, he actually hurt himself this time, you know? He usually gets away with murder. What's the prognosis? I'm gonna guess somewhere six months to a year, and it's really hard to predict from the, from the injury. You know, you think about, like, you read in the paper every day, guys tear their ACL, right? Probably the most common injury you read in the paper. That's nothing. It's like, it's just a walk in the park compared to what he had. So it's a big injury. He's going to have that same type of process. And, you know, all the sports he does are so core dependent. So, I mean, it, even if Every time you get injured as a pro athlete, there's that moment where you're just like, all right, is this it? I mean, breaking your pelvis, especially at that age, how is this going to impact what I'm going to do for the next 30 years? I thought I might be dancing out of here without crutches, but... You know, maybe that was a bit optimistic, so. The six months to a year is a little scary, but that's all right. We'll make it faster. We'll go, go for six months instead of a year, that's for sure. My plan is to come out the other end of this better than I was on that way in. I think most people at my age, if they had this injury, they go, okay, I guess it's time to throw in the towel and slow down. 
it's more a kick in the butt to actually get a little better than I was. The thing is, is Rob's got a pretty good self-preservation gene. I mean, he does some pretty crazy stuff, but it's all calculated. He's not reckless in any way. He calculates the risk and either throws the dice or doesn't. But it's not an age thing that he's getting old and, and no, no, no. It's the, that's not why this accident happened. This accident happened because the dice came up crap. Hi. Hey. What's up? So the cameras are here, and then you come to say hi. No. Of course. <laughs> it's his first time saying hi in six weeks of dying here in my Well, bathroom. I've been trying to call him, but he just doesn't like calling back, you know, even when he's injured, so. Yeah. Ringer's off. You got the big scar there. Yeah, did you see that? It's pretty solid. That's when the baby came out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So you're not going to get injured for a long time after this. This was it. This done. is the last injury. Last one. Yeah. You're done. Pow, got it out of the way. Knock on wood. Or is this wood, really wood? No, it's fake. <laughs> <laughs> you use the windowsill. This is plastic paneling. They don't make houses like this anymore. <laughs> this is like 1965 prime. Well, don't worry. It was super epic yesterday, but you didn't miss it. Oh, wow. It was biggest that it's been for a while. Like mass die. Well, well over. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Sorry to break the news, but... When you can't go, you don't want to know. There was spray going over the trees onto the road. Like, it was, I've never seen it that big before. Fuck. And here I sit. Robbie never had really a major injury in his entire career. And here he just got worked and... I don't know if it's really a sign that maybe he should mellow out a little bit or maybe he should just stretch a lot more because really, you know, getting injured is so unfortunate, but it's about how you bounce back. All right, well, get out of here. Go okay. do something fun. Thanks for stopping see by. See you, Robbie. Catch okay. up with you later. All right, so you keep calling me every day the way you have been. I really oh, appreciate it. I will. <laughs> Actually, let me know how La Perouse is tomorrow. Rub it in. OK, I'll send you pictures. Are you so, on Snapchat? No. Well, you should be. I know. That's why I'm not. Okay. All right. Okay. It's good to spend some time. Yeah. Reconnect. I do believe that in your mental state, it's how you spin things that result in the outcome. And for him, I think, yeah, he has a big metal plate right over his pelvis, but I don't think that's going to actually slow him down. I'm going to walk without my crutches. Sometimes it's nice when you take a break for a little bit to recollect everything. You don't realize how, you know, some things could be in a disarray. Just your perspective of the sport, how you're riding. So I think it's gonna be a positive for Robbie because I know that's how he'll spin it. Injury is the great teacher. I can say I learned more about my body, about who I am, about what I want from injury than any successes. Successes, you don't, analyze it, you don't dissect it, you don't appreciate it. I wish success was a better teacher, but it, it only leads to, you know, more success. Oh, Deb! Last I'm day. I'm glad you're out walking around. Hello. Hi, Dad. So, my dad made this for my mom in 81, senior year of high school or junior? Senior. Senior Classic. year. So it's you know, part of a foam and airbrush. <laughs> That's cool. A windsurfing board. Two fourteen so eighty one. For Valentine's Day. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna embarrass him some more. <laughs> Look, this is him and my mom when they were in high school. They had me very young. My mom had just turned nineteen, but my dad was still eighteen. My dad, Robbie, and my mom, Bitsy, were high school sweethearts. And after their senior year, they had me. One time, I remember Robbie won the first Pan and Cup. Then he went to the hospital to see his newborn uh, daughter. He came back, and he won the other race. So in the same day, we won the two races of the day 
with the interval to go to the hospital and see the newborn girl. I think there might have been a level of immaturity or not. It's like that show, 16 and pregnant, what do we do? And here he is at the most amazing point of his career being a superstar. Thank God, Carol and Rick, my grandma and grandpa, they're so hands-on and they really raised me a lot too. Becoming a father at such a young age requires a lot of maturity, which he really did have. But he also had his work, which demanded travel. You know, I've been with family, and an incredible swell pops up on the radar. And you're like, hey, guys, <laughs> got to go, you know? And, um, you know, you sort of take yourself out of these family events and things like that to go do this thing that you do. Your whole goal is to be the best that you can be. Do you think his lifestyle impacted the marriage? Yeah, that, that ended it. I would blame being young and famous for that. I married my first girlfriend, so that was sort of <laughs> doomed. We never fought, we just grew and I went windsurfing at her house. I went to her wedding. You know, it's not like we're enemies. We stayed quite good friends. Saw her last week on Oahu. Um, it just would have been good to have been, you know, there with Nani more, but the time we did spend together was really, really good. I mean, better than what a lot of parent-kid relationships are like, where they spend their entire childhood seeing their parents every single day. My dad was always traveling, but that was normal to me because that's what my dad did. He would go and he would windsurf, I knew that, and then when he came back, we would have a lot of fun together and then he would go again. I never really knew for how long or what time, but I think that kind of added to the excitement because when we did see each other, it was so much fun. I would have had a really different life had I not been traveling through the 80s and 90s, and, but that's who I am. I, I can't even imagine who I would have been and what my life would have been like if I were doing something different. I wouldn't have been a pro athlete for sure. I couldn't have done one and not had the other uh, consequence. Hi, girls. Why are you that one? Why am I using those? Because I hurt myself. Look, I have a big owie. Hi, Lily. I got an owie, too. How are you? I'm Rolo. I got an owie, too. You got an owie, too? Where? On my foot. On your foot? This accident made him sit down and relax and focus on what he wants and what's going to make him happy. When you're constantly on a plane and going to new places and traveling around and on new adventures, you don't sit down and face your issues if you're so easily able to just get up and go. Does he have issues to face? I'm sure he does, doesn't everybody? have an incoming call. Hey, Katie. Hey. Just want to be sure you're getting her today, right? Thursday? I'm on my way right now. OK, awesome. I figured. I just I just felt a little weird, so I just want to make sure. Yeah, no. I didn't always good to check. OK, awesome. Well, have fun, you guys. Thanks, right. Tommy. Thank you. Bye. Call ended. Did you get that? What's going on? Hi. Hey. Hello, beautiful. Thank you. Did you get graded on your book report yet? How'd you do? Yes. Awesome. Fives. Woo! 
what you think. Let's see, let's see, let's see. I know, you were worried that it wasn't going to be cool, but I think you're going to like it. Christina at the moment because we have nothing formalized and what Katie thinks is best for Christina is not necessarily what I do. I think spending so little time with her dad is not a good thing. Pythons digest every part of its prey except for the fur and feathers. What do they do with the fur and feathers? They spit it out. Oh yeah? They don't poop it out? I don't even think they have a butt. Maybe we can Google it. Mm. Pythons. Oh my. Okay. Here we are. I did not need to see that. Well, you could make that part of no. your report. Look, it looks like a lifesaver. Oh my god. A red lifesaver. A red lifesaver. Oh. <laughs> Getting divorced is challenging, painful. It would be good to have it behind us, both for Katie and. Christina and myself, so we're gonna that a lot. Being a professional waterman, there's a solitude about it, for sure. You're in your own little world out there, and that's, I think, what draws people. Any worries you have, you'll pretty much forget them when you get out in the water. So this is your spot. This was my spot for an awfully long time. I can't really say it is anymore, but yeah. There's just cliffs, it's kind of the main break right in front. As a kid, I was pretty shy, kind of a loner. I really enjoyed doing things on my own. And I was never really the best at anything until windsurfing. And there was something that, you know, I didn't like claim it, but I knew I was pretty good at it. And that, that feels good, you know, and makes you want to keep doing it. Every time you go in the ocean, you feel something. You're tapping into this energy and you get to a point where you kind of need to do that like on a regular basis and when you don't something just doesn't feel right injury and robbie definitely don't mix he was always game on so this is a whole new chapter that he didn't want to open but it found him and when we have injuries and stuff we do what we can to fight through them and and we just tell ourselves okay we're healing now Fuck, it's nice over here. Robbie's a warrior. He's gonna be back like nothing happened. Robbie Nash is very tenacious. When he puts his head to something, he's gonna do it. So do you think we'll be making our trip to Namibia? 100%, I'm not even concerned. And if not, I'm gonna be like, come on, Robbie, don't be a wuss. <laughs> <laughs> Because this actually might be a really good board for those waves, too, just the pumpy down the line. Oh, yeah, no, I think, I mean, that one's... Because it's a way faster rocker. We might fight over it, you never know. We're going to Namibia, just scrambling to get all my stuff, kind of last minute, leaving a day earlier than expected, and you know how that goes. Just total rush. It's good, though. It's what it's all about. Life can change your situation anytime. An accident, a sickness, or a fortune, or another thing can lift you up or put you down. And Robbie has been in so many crossroads in his life. Now is a moment of his life where you want to discover other things, like the longest wave, and uh, put his signature on that. Of where you're going to be? No? In the middle of the desert. In the middle of the desert. Yeah, 
Can we get a, an AO available to speak to somebody at the airport at this hour? What I don't want to do is fly with you maybe a, in the number of days. No, 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 without the surfboard. I get it. It's just a, a part of your half. It's like an arm. I get it. He's got to have his arm. No, no, he, he, I, I know. So we'll, let's see what we can do. Okay. The very first flight of Robbie and Chuck, they basically didn't get their boards on the plane. Everything else made it but their boards. Uh, got the airlines to get them on board some flight. They sent us some photos of the boards being loaded somewhere. I don't know where, but they were going on some plane. Ty flew separately, and his boards actually showed up. We're hoping that Robbie's and Chuck's boards show up soon. So we do, do we not have enough door bags? I, I don't know what those guys have, so I can't say. I'm pretty sure no other boards came. Right. <laughs> At least the line made it. <laughs> Did we get all our stuff? Not all of it. No? Yeah, I think uh, you have... Did Chuck get his yet? Yeah, you guys don't have anything. Nothing. We kind of need our kite stuff, though, because it's so windy. I got two kites. One bar. I got nothing. We're still missing four bags. What a bummer. Are they all in Johannesburg? Or no, no one knows. No one knows. One a day, Chuck. We'll get one a day. And then we'll get the, the one with the little boards in it, and they'll be broken in half. <laughs> <laughs> There's like 300,000 seals. It's pretty crazy. We're in the middle of Africa, it's on a blade of grass. Isn't it a crazy place? That's pretty sick, the crystal. We're going pretty much almost halfway around the world, and uh, of course, you know, we hit a couple pitfalls, losing our boards. It's like suddenly this huge stop sign hit you straight in the face. It sucked. You start to think about what else could go wrong. It's like half the size it was yesterday. You can see the buoys just spike, so I mean, it's... It spiked and then started going down, like, yeah. really rapidly. Yeah, which was the forecast, more or less, so... The swell clearly hasn't gotten here yet. Yeah. Let's wait. Robbie goes nuts if he doesn't do something every day. He's that guy that has to go surfing, has to go sailing, or gotta get him. some adrenaline going in his system every single day. It's just the way his brain works. He's just an entirely different person on the board. Dude, that's actually like a legit wave right yeah. there. I bet she could pump around the whole thing. <laughs> surfing is a very unique sport. It's very challenging, very demanding, but it gives you just enough that you keep coming back time and time again. Why is that? <laughs> Why doesn't matter? It's just the way it is. That one would be all right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but get one of the sets, see, like on there, and yeah. ride it all the way across. Yeah, do that. But it gets in you. It's an, <laughs> an emotional, subconscious sort of, like I'm not one of those heavy. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about the universe and stuff. But it's, <laughs> I don't do drugs but it's a what you're getting out of it is kind of the same thing as what we get out of surfing. And almost like a drug addict, if you don't do it for a couple of days, you start feeling like you need it, you know? Bobby's boards have finally come in, so we have all the gear. It took us three days, a six hour drive in the middle of the night, but we have boards for tomorrow. The boys are sleeping and no, we'll see some surprises on their face tomorrow. We're very happy. Very happy. People want to cry. <laughs> That's the most important part. Now all we gotta do is hope we have waves. This is the smallest it's been. <laughs> wow. I was envisioning like it was gonna be bigger, but yeah. I was envisioning way bigger, like scary bigger. Like wondering how to paddle out bigger. You go around the whole world. 
looking for something. You fly around, you're half cocked, you haven't slept, you don't have your stuff, and then you have sub-level conditions. It's frustrating. You gotta go, no expectations, no disappointments. They've done it a long time. They've gotten plenty of barrels. They want the, the big, long, all the way to the bottom yeah. barrel. They're here all the way across the world because they want to get that really good wave. And I don't blame them. You know, it's, it's tricky when you put pressure on it. I mean, these waves don't like these cameras. They run from that stuff. <laughs> this is actually... Actually, you know what? Shut up. I'm talking right now. <laughs> This is what we do when we're not in the water. It's just like, just sit here and just try to pass the time. As a pro athlete, where you're just traveling the world and you're looking for waves, you're really trying to make something happen. There's that moment where you're just like, all right, is this it? And then from that point, it just becomes what you make of it. I think it's hard to tell what's going through Robbie's head necessarily. He kind of jokes mostly about his problems than actually like talks and like, you know, gets actually emotional about it, at least in front of me. <laughs> at least it's windy and cold. What's the update? Uh, 17 to nine, Dodgers are winning. <laughs> it's just been a world champion for so long. He's probably using what he's learned competing his whole life and he's applying it to this. I mean, you kind of got to step back and remove the emotional side of things. Because if you get emotional in competition, you can crumble. And he's not 